our first speaker today is Mutu, and he's asked me not to say anything else about him, so I won't. <laughs> Uh, thank you for some coming in so early for the talk. Uh, <coughs> I looked at the participants and realized that uh, we are from many different communities. And uh, what I'm trying to communicate is how people in my community, that's algorithms research, think about some of the problems that may be of common interest. And uh, the one exercise I'd like you to keep in mind is the following. You are all experts in your respective areas. and. Uh, it's difficult being an expert in algorithms because uh, every computer scientist thinks they do algorithms. Right? Every uh, cooking person thinks they do algorithms as well because they know the recipes are algorithms. Uh, but we know that algorithms research is a particular style of doing algorithms. And uh, as a result, over time, I've developed this question that says, uh, imagine you're in a party and somebody comes up and says that they work in your area. You want to think of a single question to ask them that if they know the answer, you'll be sure that they're an expert in the area. And the, question, and the question should be reasonable. It should not be something that only you and a few other colleagues know about. And it should not be a gossip question. It should be a technical question. It should be. You know. So if you think about this exercise, it's very valuable. Okay. In algorithms, I know the answer to this question. Okay. If I, uh, if somebody tells me they work on algorithms, I ask them, uh, how much time does it take to find the median of n elements? Okay. If they say n log n, they don't know algorithms. If they say n, they know algorithms, the algorithms research. Okay. Uh, I'd like you to do the same exercise with machine learning other areas, uh, and, and it's a worthwhile exercise. Okay. So it tells us how we uh, target our research. And um, talking about targeting research, I was, uh, you know, uh, Joshua was very nice to invite us for dinner, and uh, I was talking to uh, people in astronomy, and they were talking about research, and one of them said, it's not earth shattering. So I was thinking that if you're an astronomer, you don't want to do earth shattering research. <laughs> you may want to do something else, but not in general. Okay. So we all have our metrics, and uh, I'm going to communicate how algorithms researchers like me think about these problems. And you heard already a lot of algorithms researchers talk. You heard Suresh talk, you heard Petros talk, and several others. Um, so this is not new, uh, <coughs> uh, but let's see if we can have some fun. So I'm going to talk about an area called data streams, which in the last 10 years or 15 years has uh, become um, uh, quite accepted as a the area of research, and uh, again, I've so many different communities work on it, and I want to tell you uh, my take on this. I'll start with a very simple puzzle that many of you have seen before. It's an interview question in Microsoft Research, I was told, or Microsoft Engineering. Okay. Uh, and um, it's a good puzzle to start out with, and it leads to nice research as well. Okay. So the, in the puzzle, we have two players, A and B, Alice and Bob, and there are numbers one to one through N, one, two, three, up to N. And uh, what Alice does is takes these numbers, permutes the numbers, and shows numbers one after another to Bob, and just leaves out one of the numbers. So in other words, shows n minus one numbers to Bob. Okay. And what Bob needs to do is to figure out what was a missing number. What was a number that Alice did not show Bob? Now, of course, if you play this in reality with n equals to 4 or n equals to 10, we know the numbers 1 through 10, and if, uh, uh, and if we play the role of Bob, and if Alice showed the numbers, nine numbers, in which she left out one of the numbers, it's easy for us to remember the nine numbers that we've been shown and figure out what was the number that was not shown. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, if you play the same game with n equals to a million, it'll be difficult for us to remember you know, all but one million numbers. Okay. So the idea is that we want to solve this problem when we are not allowed to store n bits. Right? If we're allowed to store n bits, the problem is trivial. You'll declare an array of size a1 through an and set the bit to 1 whenever you see a number, and then at the end of having seen all the n minus 1 numbers, you'll just make a sweep through the array and figure out what was the missing number. Okay. So it is a simple problem to solve. If uh, B, Bob has full memory of n elements. And we're going to make the problem interesting by saying that Bob is going to have a very small number of bits, something like 2 log n. Okay. <coughs> uh, so then the question is how would you solve this problem? And you know, there's not much drama here. Uh, this is, as I said, uh, a fairly simple puzzle, and uh, I've been using interviews before. And the solution in this particular case is, uh, is very simple. All that uh, Bob does is every time Alice re re reveals a number, Bob keeps a running sum of the numbers she's, uh, that he's seen so far. Okay. So at the end of having seen n minus 1 numbers, Bob has a number s of sum of all the numbers seen so far. And Bob knows what the first n numbers add up to, so n times n plus 1 over 2. And then if you subtract the sum from, a, uh, from this max sum possible, you get the missing number. Okay. 
And what, why the solution works is because the sum of n numbers is like n squared. We need only two log n bits to store the sum. You don't need n bits to store the sum, so you can solve the problem with two log n bits. Okay. So it's a simple puzzle, but you can use it to motivate the fact that first, Bob, there are many times in which you can solve problems by storing much less information than what's in the whole input. And there's one in the beginning. If you now look at versions of this puzzle in which you, uh, Alice leaves out two elements, three elements, and so on, you pretty soon get to nice research questions. But this puzzle tells us that there are instances where we can solve problems without storing all the input. Uh, and in fact, something logarithmic in the input side. So many of you may have seen this puzzle, but I want to start this talk with uh, a different puzzle. The idea is to find a, a median in one word. Okay. Uh, just to remind people what a median is, if you have n numbers, median is a number which has, uh, uh, which is the middle rank. So if you sort the n numbers, the item which has n, minus, n over 2 is rank. Floor ceiling is the median. Okay. <clears throat> it's a halfway point in the sorted order. So the problem here is that Alice now, there's only a single player game, it's Alice, and Alice sees items arriving one after another on a string. And at any given point, Alice has to be able to tell you what is the median of the elements seen thus far. Now, of course, said again, uh, in, uh, uh, as in stream cases, if you're not allowed, the, uh, if you're allowed a lot of memory, you'll store all the elements and be able to find the median every time anybody asks for it. We're going to be particularly uh, severe. Okay, in a minute. Okay. Uh, we're going to actually assume that there is some unknown distribution from which these elements are drawn. Okay. Uh, <coughs> And the distribution goes one to n, and the elements are being drawn one after another. And Alice sees the elements being drawn and has to maintain the uh, median. But we're going to be particularly severe and say that all that Alice can remember is log n bits. Okay. Cannot remember n bits, cannot remember j bits for uh, uh, j items. It's just going to be log n bits. Okay. In other words, you can basically remember, Alice can remember only one number. The numbers are on the range of one to n, and Alice can only remember one number, and how does Alice get an estimate for the median. Now, it's a good puzzle. Okay. And why would we care about this? You know, after all, you know, there's been an argument that memory is cheap, and why do we even restrict ourselves to uh, doing this? There are good reasons for restricting our memory. One is that in many applications, the data comes very fast, and while memory is cheap, fast memory is not cheap. <laughs> Second is that if you can store small amount of memory and solve problems, you can use it to save in communication when you make the problem paralyzed. If you take a problem and put it to M machines and you want to communicate amongst them, if you can solve the problem with a small amount of space, the communication is proportional to space, and therefore you save as well. Okay. So there are many good reasons why you'll want to work with small space. Of course, you don't have to be this draconian uh, for being allowed to just have one work. Uh, but it helps because in certain database applications, you want to estimate the median of a stream, but the stream consists of many group bytes. Okay. Uh, you, you want to maintain a stream of all the uh, request delay times for every country, and the number of countries is 180 countries, or number of zip codes. So there are group by operations, and within each group by, you might want to maintain this median, so it's worthwhile to make the memory usage as small as possible for this problem. Okay. So now having said that, this problem is really a motivation for uh, us to do theoretical construct of, uh, of sort of studying this uh, limitations, and, it's, uh, and, and I would encourage you to think about this problem. Uh, because when this problem arose in a lunch conversation, uh, I had a solution in mind. It doesn't fully solve the problem. But like uh, uh, in all cases, you don't al almost always. In almost all cases, where you allow a small amount of memory, you cannot solve the problem exactly. You have to approximate something, and there's a little bit of an art on figuring out the right approximations that you can get out of uh, a situation. So of course, there is an art to getting a solution and an approximation here, but there is an even further art to giving a hint to solve the problem. You know, I'm, I'm part of a cult of people who solve puzzles. I, I yesterday had dinner with Peter Winkler, who's one of the great puzzle solvers. And uh, you know, he comes to my, comes to have dinner with me, and uh, in his pocket he takes out a puzzle. So you know, so uh, there's a lot of puzzle solvers there. And, and one of the important things we know in solving puzzles is that you have to give people time to solve puzzles. And at some point they're going to ask you for a hint, and it's an art to figure out how to give a hint, which gives gets them some way, but not all the way. Okay. So in this particular case, the hint I worked out was that. Uh, uh, there's absolutely only one thing you can do. That's all you have to keep in mind. 
Okay. To solve this problem, if you think about it, there's absolutely only one thing you can do. And that's that's all we can work with. Okay. So that's a good hint, and I'll let you figure this out. I'm not going to give you the solution. Okay. So those two puzzles are meant to say that there are problems, uh, sometimes exactly or sometimes approximately. You can solve them with small amount of memory. And now this is a theory for 15 years of what we can do with small amount of memory. And I have the advantage of being able to look back and say, oh, well, having done all the theory, could we abstract some very basic tools that we can communicate to others? And if we had a tool in your bag, you could solve problems on your own. Okay. So this is one such tool. Okay. So the talk is going to be sort of in two parts. Well, the first part is this basic tool, which we know for quite some time. And the second part is about the new tools that we're generating now, which we hope will be percolating over time into other applications. Okay. So the first tool. Um, <coughs> Uh, is, a pro is, a, is a tool for solving the following problem. You're given an array 1 through n. It's a large array, and it's only virtual in the sense you don't actually materialize this whole array. And what you see are updates to the array, which means that either an increment of an item or a decrement of an item. So this array is tracking the frequency of each element. If you might insert an element, that can be considered as adding 1 to its frequency. And if you de delete an element, it can be considered as Subtract one for the frequency. So f of i, f i, sorry, is the number of times you've seen i so far. So every time you see a new i, a new new instance of i, you add one to it, and every time you delete it, you have minus one. So f i is the frequency of i. And so if you have this large array in mind, and you're seeing one after another of inserts and deletes into this collection. And what you want to do is to answer a simple question at some point when a query arrives and says, well, what is f i? So in other words, how many times have you seen element i? You would answer the frequency question. Now, as I mentioned, if I can materialize the entire array and sort of declare an array of size n, then obviously every operation can be done in constant time, increment, decrement in constant time. And then when somebody asks for query of what is f10, f100, you can go look up the 10th of 100th element at the random axis, and in constant time you can answer the question. Okay. So we know that this is trivial to solve if you allow full memory. What we're going to do is to make sure that we solve the problem with very small memory. Not even log n. Okay. So think of n as a million or you know, 10 to the power 12, but we want to solve the problem using 1,000 bytes, something much smaller than even log n. So by the way, once we understand the solution, we'll see why this is the core problem we hang basically of most algorithms that we can do in small space. <coughs> um, so here's how the algorithm is going to work. It's, a, it's a basically a simple table. Each row here corresponds to a hash function, and there's going to be uh, one over delta log one over delta hash functions. Del so the solution that we're going to come up with is going to be approximate, and it's also going to be uh, with high probability. Okay. So there's some probability of failure. So delta governs the probability of failure. So the number of hash functions is determined by the amount of success and failure that you want. And each hash function takes the array one to n and maps it into cells one through one, something like uh, one over epsilon. And this one is going to be the approximation. So the hash functions take n and reduce the universe down to something proportional to the uh, 1 over epsilon, which governs approximation, while the number of hash functions govern the failure of success or, success or failure probability. And what we're going to do is every time you initially everything that initially is to 0, and when you see an update to an element i, you take i and use a hash function, h, h, h1 of i, the first thing hash to some element bucket. We're going to add one, one to this count here. Do that for every one of the hash functions. So for once, so sort of, for people who want to get an idea for hash function, think of it as something like ax plus b mod p. So h of x is a hash function which maps x to ax plus b mod p, where a and b are carefully chosen, and p is a carefully chosen prime. Okay, so it's a simple uh, uh, algebraic function. And that has a property of sort of taking x and sort of uh, taking each element one after another, and you can sort of spread it out all the buckets randomly. Because we're going to choose this function randomly, the random one. So each hash function therefore maps each element to some bucket here in one row. So I, you track all the increments here, increments and decrements on this bucket here. Same thing with the second hash function, third hash function, and so on. So every time you see an update to an item i, you apply the update to each of the rows. And each row it will get applied to one of the one of the cells or one of the buckets. And then when somebody will ask us, ask us to say, well, you know what, you're practicing this. Tell me what is f10 or f100 or f i. 
Again, you can take i and use this hash function to figure out where it lands. It will land in one bucket in each one of the rows. Each one of these buckets has a count. We just return the minimum value of the count. Okay. <coughs> and that's going to be our approximation. Okay. So this is a simple data structure. It's a, bunch of, uh, it's a table of counts. And we increment decrement counts and pull out some counts and return the minimum value. Those are the operations we perform. Now, what can you say about this function, uh, this, this data structure? The estimate that we return will always be at least a correct value of that function. Because we're looking at a, all the places where i fell, hash terms, is because of the various hash functions, and we're returning the minimum value. So, whatever was f i, you contributed to each of those counters. So, all that we can have is other items we have contributed to the bucket, but that will not lower the value. We're going to assume that all f i is greater than equal to zero. If we don't have any negative values. So whenever i falls, we put the counter and return the minimum value, so if i definitely contributed each one of the counters. Some other people contributed to it, but that will not decrease the estimate. So the estimate is at least a correct value. And it's at most the correct value, plus epsilon times is going to be the approximation part. Sum of all the other frequencies. So you have a large array that are some elements which are 1, 10, 100, and some million somewhere, perhaps. Your estimation of any particular item says that you will return a correct value, at least a correct value, but at most a correct value plus epsilon times sum of all the items. Okay. So it's not a good relative approximation, meaning if the item was small, you don't get a good relative approximation to it. But if the item was large, you'll get a pretty good approximation because if it dominates the whole function, the whole array, you'll get a good approximation. Okay. And that's the kind of guarantee you can get. So <clears throat> Uh, the other thing to observe uh, is that the space we use is only 1 over epsilon times log 1 over delta. So epsilon is the approximation, say 1 in thousand or something, and the probability is next to say 1 in 100. So this is going to be something like a, a thousand bytes or a few, few hundred bytes. <laughs> well, n can be arbitrarily large. So the, the data structure that we keep is even independent of n. So we're not likely to get great approximation. So that's, that, that, that's what is reflected in the kind of approximation guarantee we give. So it's a very small space, and the update time is very quick. Right? Every time I increment, we just have to go and increment each one of the counters. There are only like uh, three or four counters or ten counters, log one over delta. Okay. So update is very fast. Space is different than that. But what we do of this is that we get an approximation rather than exact answer. Uh, this is called a count mean sketch. Uh, I'm not going to show you the proof. Uh, the proof is basically elementary. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more editorial comments about the data structure. Uh, you might want to see whether, uh, again, I'm not going to go through this proof as well, but I want to tell you what the result is. Well, I told you about the data structure, which has some approximation, some update time and space. And this argument here would argue that you cannot do better than that. You cannot do better than 1 over epsilon space if you want to get this kind of approximation that we did. Okay. So we use space proportional to 1 over epsilon. And if you have to use at least 1 over epsilon space to get the kind of guarantees we get. Okay. The proof is through a very simple reduction to something in communication complexity. If people are interested, I'll talk to you offline about it. Now, what's interesting about this, uh, about this data structure, is that <coughs> I've given talks about this to statisticians, and almost always the first thing that a statistician would think about is that I can solve this problem by sampling. Okay. Because 1 over epsilon sounds like uh, 1 over epsilon squared or 1 over epsilon, and there's no sampling bounds. We know a lot about the sampling techniques, and so we should be able to solve the problem by sampling. Okay. The one thing I'd like to point out is that this, this structure is doing something quite non trivial. It, sounds, it looks very simple, it proves simple, but it is doing something non trivial. Because imagine this case where we have some arbitrary million items inserted in the data structure. Okay. And you're going to only keep a small amount of memory, a thousand items. Okay. Maybe you want to keep a thousand samples. And then, that's the that's data structure here. That's all the memory you have of what happened in the past. And then somebody re removes everything except four items. Okay. At this moment, you don't know which four items are going to remain. Okay. You're going to keep some of the information about what you've seen so far, but Somebody removes all the four items, and ultimately only with four items, but you have a lot of middle space, a thousand lights now, or a thousand samples. If you want to get a good list, work, uh, if you want to get answering questions on this, figure out which elements are present, and so on, sampling would have a difficult time doing this. 
Because if you take any sample of 1,000 items here, you have no idea which ones are going to be removed. You cannot, you have very small probability of reaching the four items which are going to be removed each other. But in fact, for all possible sequence of what's going to come next, your sampling is not going to work. So the idea is that sampling is very good when you're adding items, when you're deleting items, you really have to figure out how to maybe even resample, etc. But you see items one after another, your memory is only whatever you've kept here, you're not going to go back and resample. So on the other hand, this current data structure, can't mean data structure I mentioned, is a completely linear data structure. So if I kept a thousand bytes of this distribution here so far, and then if I just remove all the items, I just subtract out everything, it's all totally linear. Finally, what I would have would be a counting structure for the four items that are left behind, and that would be perfect. And now if you have, if you want to estimate the frequency of any item with one in a thousand of, uh, of accuracy, you will actually figure out which items are exactly present in the data. In other words, you saw a large number of items, you have a small number of bytes, but after a whole bunch of items are removed, you're able to exactly retrieve the four items which are left behind, no matter which of the others, which of the four remain. Okay. So that's because of the linearity of this data structure. Okay. So this is, an, this is just to explain to you why I wouldn't immediately assume that the kind of bounds we are getting can be obtained by even sophisticated sampling techniques. So what can you do with this? Uh, this looks like, uh, like uh, I'm talking about a third puzzle, right? And I talked about the first two puzzles, and this data structure looks like a third puzzle. Okay, and, uh, the good news for us is that it's actually not a puzzle. It's the primitive on which you can build most algorithms that we can uh, you know in this area. So if, you know, if any of you people are database people, you know that indexing query means that you can keep some items in a B tree, and you can look up any particular item. And once you have that, you can do range queries. Then you can do both, uh, R tree. You can do a whole bunch of data SQL queries based on the data structure. It's something similar uh, analogy here. Once you've figured out how to keep a large array that is being incremented and decremented with a small space so that you can answer any particular item query, you can use it as a building block to build a large number of algorithms. So for example, you can send you write a small piece of code. You, know, you, um, you have a bunch of data going by, you make in a small data structure, and then later you can look at the data structure of what is F1, what is F2, what is F3, and you can ask all the FN queries. Now, many of them will give you bad approximations because many of them will be very small items, but the ones which are large will get good estimate, and you can use that later on. Okay. So, and, and that's one way to use it. Similarly, as I mentioned, this is a linear data structure, which means if I, have, if, you have, if I have a distribution F and if you have a distribution G, and I want to look at what are the differences, then I can keep my data structure, the data structure, subtract the data structure, just subtract arithmetic, and the result will be a sketch of the difference of the two, uh, two streams. And then I can ask questions like, in the difference, which what is the, what is the first element, the second element frequency, and so on, and figure out the large items in the difference. So you can do things like, what's the difference of the data from yesterday to today, from one this is one location to another location? You can do all of this by operating on this this sketch data structure. Right. You can do more with it. You have this large array n, and you can do something like wavelet uh, kind of uh, hierarchical decomposition. You can build a sketch not for this array F1 through Fn alone, but for an array in which you take two elements, two non-overlapping elements next to each other and collapse them into a half-size array, then another half and so on, so logarithmic level of arrays. Think of all these virtual arrays, and you can compute a sketch for all of them in parallel. There's a log and extra memory, log and extra storage and computation. But once you have it, you can actually do very quick binary search through this array. If somebody wants to find out what's the sum of these bunch of numbers here, in other words, you ask, uh, supposedly the frequencies of items sold in various zip codes, you can ask, what was the total sales in zip code you know, 1010 to 200, uh, 10010 to 20010, you can do a range query on this. And that'll be all logarithmic operations. So all of this can be done very quickly if we do logarithmic level of hierarchical sketches. None of these will be considered research in my area. These are all simple application of the basic tool once you have it. Right? We know how to build hierarchical trees, we can create them. You can use it to compute things like what are some of the squares of frequencies. You can, in fact, take two vectors and compute the inner product. Okay. Again, to, to a proper approximation, but you can do that by just taking count and multiplying them out and doing the right estimator. Okay. So notice that all these operations will be proportional to sketch size, okay. not proportional to the original data size. Okay. In fact, there's a very nice piece of results that says that you can do matrix multiplication with a compressed, <coughs> and it's a compressed way in the sense that even if the matrix of size n squared, you can do the computation in time proportional to the number of non-zeros plus 
the size of the matrix n times the size, the size of the sketch. So this, this is like 1 over epsilon log 1 over delta. So this is merely linear the number of non-zero elements, plus n is the number of the dimension of the matrix times the sketch size. So in this nearly linear the number of non-zero elements, you can get a pretty good estimate for the product of the two matrices. So based on what I talked about some of the results of this genre. Uh, this is a good result that goes beyond a lot of results that we know in a sense it's even less than quadratic time. It doesn't look at, you know, uh, getting some time proportional to n square with an approximation of this type, you can do it. This result managed to get it something less than n square. <laughs> proportional number of non zeros. And they give you some provenience, provenience non type of approximations. What you can do is you can basically replace much of the sketch computation by the sketch I told you and get a result uh, which will be much faster, which will be much smaller space. This result will use 1 over epsilon square bound to get the kind of approximation that is 1 over epsilon. There's some detailed provenience now available now we can talk about it as people, but uh, well, I'm, I'm presenting this, not the details of the result, but as an example of saying that once you have this tool, you should be able to approach any other result in the paper and say, well, you know, they've done some algorithmic work, can I replace the code with some of these techniques and get something better? And it's fairly easy and trivial to do this. So what do we know about this sketch? Uh, <coughs> it's been used for finding heavy hitters, heavy differences, and many of you know the data of compressed sensing. And uh, um, <coughs> You can, you can just account in sketch I told you, you can basically get nearly the best compressed sensing result right now. Okay. So you don't need to have the RIP property, you don't need to have all the embedding metric property, you can basically use account in sketch and reproduce much of the compressed sensing results in an algorithmic way. It's pretty exciting if you think about it. Okay. Uh, in the last few years, people have used this for uh, natural language processing, machine learning. There are people who use this for hash kernels. I don't know what they are, but they use them. I intend to find out what they are. Yeah. Uh, there's a very cute application uh, uh, of this data session is something called password checking problem, which got covered in New York Times. So, uh, basically, the idea is that rather than forcing people to think very carefully about what passwords they, uh, they want to use with all these rules and conditions, you have a more natural way of choosing password, except that you have a very quick way of checking that there are no collisions. Okay. And they use this count and sketch to check that there are no, there are very, there, that there are no collisions. Okay. Uh, <coughs> There are people writing code for this. There are, in fact, hardware implementation of the data structure. There are systems that use this. And there's a wiki site where you can see more and more about this. In fact, recently, uh, Joe Hallerstein sent a link to a nice implementation of uh, CM Sketch in um, Madlib. It's a nice sort of open source sort of parallel data structure, parallel database work that Joe has been doing. And this is one of the data structures he worked on putting it in. It's very nice. Uh, but this will give you a way to track what's going on there. So the summary here is that uh, I'm stating as a hypothesis, a, hypothesis a, a, a claim. The claim is not only due to the data structure, it's due to 15 years of work. The claim is that we used to believe earlier that polynomial time was great. If you can store all the data and work in polynomial time, you're in a good place. Or even linear time was a good goal, was a great goal. And now what, what these data structures do is to try to see that you don't have to capture all the data, you don't have to store all the data, you don't have to communicate all the data. You can do something sublinear in each one of the categories and still do most of the, many of the analysis we care about. And now, a lot of people have gone to making this argument. Uh, and, I, I, and I've seen this excitement come from many different areas, not only from theoretical computer science, but from signal processing from uh, other areas. It's very cool. Okay. Now, <coughs> This is uh, one. Uh, let me make one editorial comment. This is called a sketch data structure. There are others. There are many sketch data structures out there. Okay. Uh, like random projections, not all sketch data structures are the same. Okay. Like hashing, not all hashing is the same. Okay. There are many different data structures that differ on space use, time for update, what kind of estimates they can provide, okay. and the reason why I talked about this, this sketch data structure other than others is that. Almost every other data structure I know more or less relies on johnson lindell type of embedding. They use space 1 over epsilon squared to get epsilon approximation. And you need it for some problems, but what this data structure does is it finds 
it uses one over epsilon space to get appro epsilon approximations for many problems that we actually care about, which we can use as a, as a, as a building block. Now, what's interesting about it is that if you've done anything in practice, epsilon tends to be like one in hundred, one in thousand. So one over epsilon of a thousand we can work with. One over epsilon squared of a million, it's hard to work with for a memory space. So it makes a big difference whether you use one over epsilon or one over epsilon squared. And this is the only data structure I know that actually uses one over epsilon space. So it avoids going through the Jonathan Lindell stress type of embedding for L2. And so it just directly solves the problems we care about and gets the one over epsilon space. So that's something to keep in mind. It's uh, used at, at this moment in, um, analy uh, for analyzing IP traffic packets as they go through the uh, links. It's used, in, as far as I know, in every DSL head in this country that at and has. And they very crucially use this fact that the sketch is additive. Uh, it's part of a, a similar system in Sprint called CMON, where they use it to, uh, where they use it to parallelize. Uh, it's also quite useful in decreasing communication if you want to do distributed data analysis, like they do in uh, MapReduce based computations. And well, it's been sort of very useful in these cases. One of the challenges of this area has been that uh, there's a lot of database communities that worked on this problem. And in database community, we, ch we choose to have general purpose query languages and systems rather than pro systems that solve specific problems. So these systems solve specific problems of analyzing IP traffic data. You wouldn't want to use it to analyze Walmart sales. Okay, that's not what it's meant for. You can't run any SQL query and join them very nicely. Okay. These this, this sections are all these systems are all specialized systems. So it does. So from a database point of view, a good question would be, can we actually make these streaming techniques fairly general purpose enough to have general streaming systems? And well, there will be claims that people are able to build prototypes of the type uh, of this nature. I'm not convinced that we've been able to successfully ad addressing many of the kind of, sort of fundamental technical systems problems of building general data stream systems. Okay. So as far as I can tell, these techniques have been useful for specific careful analysis, but not for general purpose SQL query or whatever. Okay. Five minutes or no? Oh, you have time. I have time? Yes, it's fine. Oh, very good. I think it was, uh, I think it was Preston who said that uh, you're in real trouble when the audience uh, looks at the watch. But, you know, you're in trouble when the audience looks at the watch, but you're in real trouble when they take the watch and shake it like this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be late by 10 minutes, and I thought, no, this is a bad start. People are going to shake their watch even before I begin. <laughs> That'll be really bad. Um, now, in a way, I'm aware that I'm talking to people who do fairly sophisticated analysis. They use R code, MATLAB, Mathematica, and they do very complicated analysis. And to them, simple things like finding what is the highest location, like what's the difference, what are the big values, and so, et cetera, doesn't sound like a uh, most complicated problem. Okay. Uh, but my claim is that if you give me a machine learning problem that you care about, and if we really had to make it small space, if the problem really demands large amount of uh, this kind of resource constraints, most problems don't. Most times people build the models and then do classification online or prediction online, then you don't need the small space. You don't need kind of resource constraints. But if you ever give me a problem where the resource constraints are real, then chances are we're going to solve them using some of these techniques. Okay, that's the argument, and um, you know. So I wouldn't argue that these are the tools that you need for every problem that you solve. But if you do hit the resource constraints of the type these problems address, then these are the right techniques to use. Uh, so in that spirit, what I want to do is talk about sort of next generation of tools. So this, these tool, the tool I talked about is nice, useful, widely applicable. But it's also from several years ago, and uh, we had gone on to other areas. We are now trying to look at new models, new ways of data analysis. And I thought, I'll, uh, well, some of the tools like Comment and Sketch may be more, uh, so maybe no, known to some people. I thought what I'll do is sort of present an example of a few of the techniques that we have in the last couple of years, which are not as well known and may be useful. Okay. <coughs> uh, Um, so after talking uh, this morning, I sort of realized that maybe I should talk a little bit more about MapReduce or parallelizable code. There are wonderful efforts in the machine learning community on um, sort of MapReduce libraries, open source libraries for a lot of machine learning analysis. I haven't looked at all this stuff yet, 
Okay. Uh, but if anybody's interested in talking about MapReduce versions of these algorithms, I'll be happy to talk to them because I coded a bunch of this stuff in MapReduce and I can literally talk about challenges of making this thing parable. Um, <clears throat> I want to tell you about three different models that we're working with. Okay? And again, in each of those cases, I'm going to tell you the very simple problems we want to solve. Once you solve them, the rest of the structure will come together. Okay? So I'm going to start with the first problem, which is about monitoring something in a distributed world. Okay? So imagine there are a bunch of sensors, and they're all trying to talk to some centralized server or centralized sensor, and you want to compute something over the set of all sensors. Okay? Now, this is a very large set of class of problems. Sensors could be small, big, there could be power restrictions, communication, so on. And many of you have probably heard a lot of stories of this type. And, I, and I'm not going to tease out what is real, what's not real here, but I'm going to be motivated by this kind of conversation to pose a simple abstract problem that we need to solve. Okay. And the abstract problem is the following. You have a bunch of uh, distributed nodes, and at time t, each of them has seen a multi-set of items. So S to T is a set of or multi set of items seen by sensor two up until time T. Okay. So you can imagine this being measuring, say, the number of the the identity of zebras that are passing through the sensor position point. Okay. Number of people going through a security counter, and so on. Okay. So it's, you know, this is a so it's a set of people that go past the security point. Okay. So that we do when we visualize this. So there are n sensors or n sites, and each of them sees a bunch of items one after another. And up until time t, you have this uh, st of i, which tells you what the i sensor is seen that far. And then there's some central site here that has to compute a function over union of all these items seen so far. You might want to figure out, <coughs> you look at all the people coming in and out of the campus, and you want to figure out how many different people use this building in a given day. Okay. So you're trying to do some aggregate computation on this question here in the central site. So the center doesn't observe every, uh, these people, so these sensors have to communicate to the center. Okay. Now, if we look at the number of bits being sent from this uh, site to the center, and what we want to do is to minimize, excuse me, uh, we will be focusing on the number of communication of bits and trying to do it back, uh, as, as small communication as possible. But to instantiate this study, I'm going to look at a simple problem that says that uh, let S be the multi set union of all items. Okay. Just to make the conversation easier, let's assume that uh, each site sees a set of items, not a multi set, okay, which means the same item doesn't appear more than once. And what we're trying to figure out is what is the size of the union. Okay. More precisely, we're saying that the center is going to say if the union size is more than some threshold tab, it's going to say, well, output one, otherwise, it's going to output zero. In other words, what the center is trying to figure out is count up to a threshold and say, if there are more than this many people in the union, then I want to say one, otherwise I say zero. Okay. So it's simply detecting the threshold of the total union size. We're going to give us a little bit of room and say that the center will output a one if the total number of people is more than tau. It's, it should output a zero if the number of people is less than tau minus epsilon. And between epsilon and tau minus epsilon and tau, we don't really care what the state of that. Because we're going to approximate the counts, so we're going to be we're going to give ourselves some room there. Okay. So that's a, that's a, that's output we want. Now, a trivial way to do this is that every time each one of the, any of the sensors sees an, a version or a new item, they send that into the version to the center. Okay. Or they set, say, in our case, okay, say, say plus one. The then all the center has to just keep the total sum, and as soon as it goes close to tau, it says one. So if any time anybody sees any new item, if the set if the set is plus one to the center, then you'll be able to solve this problem exactly. But that will require a total number of bits proportional to the number of items seen so far. Okay. And what you want to do is you solve the problem using fewer number of bits. So in other words, we want to minimize the total sum of number of bits sent from each one of the versions to the center or the total time. 
So it sounds like a little bit of a made up problem, but it's not. But what you're really trying to say is that assuming that there are n sensors and see different sets of people, and keep seeing people as people coming in, you're trying to figure out, tell me when the total number of people exceeds some number. Now, if I do that, the one chart computation is very easy, right? At any given moment, I say, I call each sensor and tell me how many people I've seen and I add up the sum. But that's not what we want to do. We want it to be continuously monitored. And as soon as the total number of people exceeds, that's when you want to see. Now, if you're a programmer, the way you solve the problem is to say that every five minutes fall. So that you're accurate up to five minutes. <laughs> Ten minutes. Okay. But that's not what we want to do here. We want to be accurate up to this. We're not going to call periodically every five minutes to call each one of the sensors. We just want the sensors to work in a graceful way and let you know when when um, threshold is here. Okay. So it's called a distributed continual monitoring problem. It's distributed because of a bunch of sensors. It's continual because you want the whole thing to work continuously. You don't want to every few minutes poll. You don't want it to stop and ask at the end of the day, day and so on. You just want it to output any time the threshold is exceeded. Okay. And our goal is to minimize the number of things. Okay. Now, <coughs> Uh, I don't have time to describe the full uh, solution in the full proof, but I'll tell you the nature of the result I'm looking for. Okay. One result would be, would be to send all the, every time a new item arrives, send a big sensor. That's a trivial solution. And no matter how you think about the problem, it feels like you cannot solve this problem without having every node send at least one bit. It looks like n should be some sort of a lower bound for this solving this problem. <coughs> And that's what we talk about. In fact, that's a lot of for deterministic algorithms. But if you think about a little bit, okay, what you want to do is something like this, right? So assuming that you know, uh, think of a solution with a two, two sensors. Each sensor is going to say, no, I see a new item. Should I tell the sensor or not? Well, now if I know that I'm very far from the threshold, if the total sum is very far from the threshold tau, I don't have to tell the sensor immediately. I can wait for some time. I can, in fact, wait until I see like tau over two elements. Okay, because if the other person is also doing the same algorithm, when they see tau over two elements, they will, they will send an element uh, uh, ping to the center, and I can just wait. I, and I, I, that's already a good approximation of the tau, tau answer. Okay. So you sort of realize that you don't have to send a bit every time you see a new element. You only have to send a bit every time some, some sort of thresholds are reached. Okay. And then you realize that you don't even have to send a bit every time the threshold is reached. You need to, you need to count sort of how many thresholds are reached, local thresholds are reached. And you can do that by randomized counting. So roughly the algorithm would look like each one of them will have a threshold of tau over n. And they'll say that whenever I reach a multiple of tau over elements, I'll send with some probability, I'll send a bit to the center. And the probability will be like, like 1 over epsilon squared, that's a sampling kind of probability. And that will be sufficient to give you this approximation of power minus epsilon in all these steps. Okay. So the main idea I'm trying to communicate is that there are instances where you don't have to send every bit. There are, in fact, instances where you don't have to send every bit when you see like half of the items or one third of the items and so on. You can choose to send bits with the randomization, with the randomized probability, the probability. And that would be enough to give you a right approximate guarantee of the okay. So if you were able to solve this problem using something like one over epsilon square bits, which is pretty amazing, uh, you know, given the number of sensors that you want to look at n as a parameter. Okay. Um, so I don't have time to go through the proof. Yeah. The way, uh, but I do, want, I do want to kind of, once you set up this, this, this basic algorithm, there will be a similar algorithm to keep track of, in fact, how many different listening people go through the network, how to cluster the endpoints. Each of the sensors sees a bunch of points, and you want to keep making a clustering of all the of the points. We can still do that with self linear communication. So we can do a compare sensing problem in this model right now. Okay. Assuming that each sensor is seeing a signal and the signal keeps changing, we can, in the center, keep a, keep a small dictionary representation of the union of all the signals. Okay, which is pretty nice as well. Okay. So we can solve all these problems right now with reasonable approximation using this idea of uh, figuring out when to send with the random instruments. And the connection I would draw would be that there's a beautiful Slavian law theorem that says that two sources can communicate even when they don't synchronize with each other at a rate that's, that is related to the sort of mutual information. It's a very beautiful theory. We are doing something, uh, you know, you have to sort of keep that roughly in mind. We're trying to develop that in a, in a, in a discrete way over a bunch of sources. Okay. Uh, if people are interested, I can have a conversation about it. Okay. Now, this is only the beginning of a theory. You don't need to have sensors talk to a center. You can have sensors talk to the intermediate nodes, and you can have a tree structure, you can have a DAG structure, and you can try to extend all this theory to all these, all these, all these uh, structures. 
But what I was, wanted to tell you was just a, a, a simple problem which you might be able to think of when you take lunch break and already give you basics of how we start thinking about other structures. I'm going to talk through two other uh, two other examples. Uh, there are two other sets of the, uh, models, two mo other models we work on which are interesting in general to the science community. One is a model in which we see a sequence of items, and each item is a probability is a, is a probability function. Uh, why would this be interesting? You can imagine seeing a sequence of uh, web searches, and each of them being tagged by a machine learning algorithm as being some some distribution of whether it's spam or not a spam, or whether it's a click or not a click, and so on. So you can imagine a sequence of items, each one of which is a small probability distribution function, and you want to talk about the sort of space of all sequences you can generate using the sequence of probability distribution functions. We can reason about such things again with a small amount of space. There's another model called stochastic model, which I really like, which is which is of the following type. Is you know that the items are going to be drawn from some distribution, and you can even compute some statistics for the distribution. But the problem we have is that we are seeing n items drawn from the distribution, and you must compute a statistics on the empirical values that you see here. So it's not that you compute a value from the distribution and then declare it as an answer. The answer has to be correct for the particular empirical distribution you see. Now, there's not much difference between these these two views if you look at simple statistics like averages, etc. But if I said I want to find a median of n elements. And you find the median of the distribution that's not necessarily the median of the empirical distribution. So we want an answer which is good for every just every draw of sequence of draws that you see. It's called stochastic streaming problems. We have ways of addressing some of these problems as well. The theory is not as well developed, but this is a good model to think about. Um, uh, Just quite recently, we have been able to uh, develop techniques for uh, being able to take a large graph and come up with a small sketch so that you can follow the edges of the graph. Okay. Uh, I didn't talk about, I didn't want to mention it because I didn't think graphs by themselves are interesting in this community, but the tools behind it may be interesting in the community is something to keep in mind. Now, in each of these cases, what we have done is we sort of sketch this plausible mathematical world and the mathematical problem. The mathematical techniques are interesting. And the, and the deal is you to think about the problem. But unfortunately, we don't really have any compelling systems. We don't have any compelling applications, therefore we don't have good systems to build around it. Okay. I now actually seen a sensor network where I need to continuously track this, uh, the statistical value. Right? So we're sort of struggling with trying to find good applications where this theory can be applied or can be motivated. So I thought I'll have it up here because some of you may have examples of where this, this matters. Okay. For stochastic streams, I did find a good motivation for it in, uh, in uh, Google search in Google advertising. Even if you know the distribution of what's going to happen the following day, the particular draw that you see that's going to happen on a given day is going to be different, and we want to be good with respect to the particular draw. And so we have this has led to some very nice research on online ad allocation problems. Okay, so I think there's a good useful model there. The probabilistic data model is very popular in the community, and. Uh, uh, <coughs> Reasonable attempts at prototypes of somewhat probabilistic query processing engines. But again, from my point of view, I'm looking for compelling applications to actually build out the systems. Now, for me, the research happens when you not only solve puzzles and how theorems, but you also find a, a, the right application where you can build a system and help you motivate your research. In the basic data streams, we had such an application in analyzing IP traffic data. We haven't found such applications for some of the other models I mentioned. Uh, I left out things like uh, analyzing not the entire stream but a window of stream. There are many models of window stream. So you don't want to, if you're looking at a series of data, you may not want to analyze all the data seen thus far, but you may want to analyze the last one hour or trading one hour, etc. with a window stream. There are a lot of women of work on doing much richer queries than I talked about, things like clustering problems. Again, in appropriate models, we can solve clustering models using the kind of communication I talked about. So you have a good handle for approaching the problem. 
In fact, if you want to do, I don't know, support virtual machine, if you want to do some sort of approximation to slow, and if you have space constraints, then you can use this technique to get to the approximation square as well. Yeah. Uh, I haven't talked about things like that, uh, how it's analyzed to not reduce uh, computation dimensions and have to talk to people offline. There is a very nice connection between this kind of analysis and privacy. Uh, for the people who are following the developments, there's been a very nice model called differential privacy for the last 10 years that gives you a way to reason mathematically about privacy of data analysis. And there's a variation of the model called pan privacy, which I really like. Um, initially, the motivation came from saying that assuming you're doing computation pri privately and you, com you claim that it's private, it's great, but if somebody breaks in and looks at your program on the state of the code, then you end up compromising many things. A, a, a good example, think about Imagine that you're keeping track of your uh, employees and the salaries, and if someone asks for average salary or uh, a good differential private solution is to take the salaries, compute the average, add some noise, and return that as an answer. The differential private theory will tell you that that's a good answer. But now if you maintain the solution, if somebody breaks and looks at a data structure, then they know everybody's salaries. So you can be private, but not secure. What pan privacy does is to develop a real model that says I want to address security and privacy together. I want a computation which is, even if somebody breaks in, you will not reveal any information about the user, and the output will be differentiated privately. It's a great uh, big goal, and they formed a very clean model. And what I'm able to do now is reproduce many of the streaming results in this pan private model. And there's a beautiful philosophical question here, which is, the span private model by itself doesn't require you to work with any small space. You can take the input, you can have quadratic space, cubic space, and you can do the computation as long as your differential private is secure. And it turns out that our lower bounds are against such arbitrary computations, but our upper bounds all use streaming algorithms. In other words, they use a very small amount of memory. So it's sort of philosophically interesting that if you want to guarantee security of your private data, you seem to want to use as small bits as possible in the storage. And so we're working through details of that. <clears throat> that is actually the end of my talk. So thank you very much. For Questions? Uh, thanks, Mithu. That was really interesting. I, I'm kind of curious about the epsilon versus epsilon squared distinction. Um, it seems like uh, the epsilon square results kind of come in when we want to measure distances with respect to two norms or uh, continuous norms and things like that. And it sort of seems like here we're doing things with respect to like one norm, seeing like your, your matrix product result. Could you maybe sort of talk about the geometry there? Does that okay, really matter? Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. It's, uh, I've struggled with this for quite some time. Uh, when I saw the sketches for the first time, they used one over epsilon square space. And because they were being used for estimating the L2 norm, and so they involve equally, they involve Johnson Linden Strauss embedding, and you can show a lower bound of one over epsilon square. <laughs> and then I asked, sort of, uh, sure, you need this for estimating this L2 distance, but do you need it for anything else? Okay. And it turns out for anything like joint sizes, finding big differences for signal processing, you don't need L2 L2 estimation at all. So you don't need uh, Johnson, uh, the distance preserving L2 embeddings for answering questions like what's the best k-term representation for a, for a signal, for the best k uh, clustering. Okay, those, and, and it's just that for a long time the community went down the path of using one over epsilon square space because they had the other handle, the, the Johnson Linden Strauss space sketch of one over epsilon square size and they used it as a handle to solve all these problems. But what this line of research says is that at least for solving this problem that we care about, you don't need this L2 embedding. Okay. Of course, if you now want to use it for L2 estimation, then you have to increase the sketch to one over epsilon square. And you can do the same thing, you can do that with the data, same data structure. You just increase the width and make some alternate differences. So, you know, plus one, minus one embedding, you can do that. Essentially, the same sketch will give you, but you need more width and more space. Uh, in fact, technically, this will end up improving uh, along the as they kind of main results <coughs> because it'll increase its width to one over epsilon square, but the update time will be a lot more over delta. So, it'll be faster and update than the kind of normal same sketches. Uh, but, uh, but that's, you need to do it only if you want to do this. And you're right that there are many, uh, there are applications within distance preservation, maybe nearest neighbors kind of computations. Uh, uh, but part of the fun has been sort of getting around it using L1. So the, the matrix result I mentioned, the final out was specifically put there to yeah. say that, you know, much of the hard work you need with the space, it's a drawing out, you can do as, a, as an exercise. 
you can replace the one and see what you supposed to get. Sometimes you don't get a good result, so I'll be honest, and sometimes you get lucky. <coughs> So as a follow-up on that, I was just curious, like, if you get the approximation guarantee, though, in terms of the L1 norm of the data stream, that seems like it could be potentially much larger than an approximation guarantee in terms of the L2 norm, which uh, distance preserving embedding might give you, though, right? So is, is that seen when you apply these systems uh, in some of the applications you mentioned, or how does that compare? So, Uh, there is this, you can do the following, you can take a particular point query estimate if I, and say, can I get an L1 estimate for this, using one over S1 square space, and can I get an L2 guarantee in the error, using one over S1 square space, and compare the accuracy versus the spaces. And in some cases, like the initial problem you'll be actually able to show that L1 guarantee is not that good. In other problems, so surprisingly, no, first of all, theoretically, you'll be able to show that they're, that they're incompatible. You won't be able to be because L2, uh, depending on how the vector is structured, either uniform or flat, uh, you won't be able to, sh you'll be incompatible. And then you have to use experiments to compare. So for example, Theodore and his students did computations with this for uh, compressed sensing. And they found the confidence sensors doing well, in fact, the best service confidence sensors in that case. Even though you won't be, you'll find an L2 and L1 guarantee incomparable. Roughly, the guarantee will be L1 over S1. L2 over square root of uh, head size, and those are the two things that you can compare. And uh, in many applications, they're comparable. Some applications, L1 is worse than L2, and then you have the result in the in worst case. So I, I'm just uh, at a comment that I think a number of people here have already started asking questions about uh, searching on graphs and best searching on graphs. So I think um, there's going to be broad applicability. Maybe not so much in some types of physical sciences, but there's um, certainly uh, for information uh, query, you know, graphs are becoming very important. Uh, so I certainly encourage you to talk about that uh, for the time that you're here. Um, I wanted to ask the audience if anyone didn't know the answer to the meeting question before coming in the room today knows the answer. You get a free lunch. <laughs> okay, well, I'll talk about it. Well, let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Thanks for a great talk.